Okay, welcome to One Tough Podcast. And we're joined, like always, with my man Carlo, the producer Buongiorno. extraordinaire. And today, I've done how many podcasts? 70 of them? This about? is, uh, we're on episode 59. Oh, I must be counting with, uh, by tens or some shit because we had a lot of people on here. But today, I say this is probably the most influential, important person of my life. Uh, uh, he did for me and put me into a stratosphere. At my 50th birthday, I said on the stage, there was one man that was responsible for my success after I retired from the police department. And I'm very honored to introduce my dear friend, he's family to me. He's not just a writer, he's not a producer, he's family to me, Nicholas Pileggi. He's a screenwriter, and everybody knows about that movie. What was it called, Carlo? Your Good favorite fellas, movie. Casino. <laughs> they go, the list goes on. On and on. And uh, Nick Pelleggi's here. And we really want to welcome you to the show, Nick. And welcome aboard. Thank you, Bo. Thank you, Bo. Now, you got to understand, Carl, this is the most interesting guy for the fact that when I retired from the police department, there was a lot of great detectives retiring. I was no better than anyone else. But there was something that happened. I get a phone call from this guy, Nick Pelleggi, and he goes, I hear you're retiring. He goes, I'd love to do a story, New York Magazine. I really wasn't a person that dealt with New York Magazine. You know, I was so busy working the streets, I didn't never even knew there was a New York Magazine. I wasn't reading, put it that way. I was locking people up. I visited, I think it was 18th Street, Nicky? Yeah, probably 19th, yeah. yeah. Yeah, was that what he was? I walk up, and there was this guy that was sitting there, I knock on the door. It was Nick, and he had this typewriter. I remember, <laughs> No electric typewriter. It was the old typewriter. And I came in. I said, Mr. Pelleggi. I said, my name's Bo Deedle. How you doing? He goes, I hear you're retiring. And then he started going. He, I said, what are you typing there? He goes, I'm, I'm writing a book called Wise Guy. Now, wait a second, Bo. Didn't you grow up in Ozone Park? Didn't you grow up with a guy named Henry Hill? Uh, Paul Vario from Atlantic Avenue, all these guys, and then Jimmy Burke. I said, Jimmy Burke, I just locked up on two murders. Uh, you know, I got caught two cold cases that, that the other guy, uh, uh, Henry Hill, gave him up on two murders, and I had to bring him from Allenwood over. So we just started talking, and the whole book of Wise Guy was from the neighborhood I grew up with. You know, I grew up with Scopo and Gotti and all those people, but these were all the players. So we started talking. Next thing is, Nick, he says, you know, I want to do I want to do a feature article on your retirement. And I told him about the decoys and stabbed and hospitalized 30 times, all my bullshit. And uh, <laughs> he wrote an article. And it wasn't just in any article. It was a great article about my life, what I went through on the police department with the negativity of the, uh, of the uh, IEDs, the Internal Affairs Division, and about them coming after me. A lot of jealousy in the police department. Someone who excels, like today, if you did what I did now, I'd be going to jail because they don't like anyone to excel right. or do your job. They want you under the radar. So Nick, he wrote this article, and, and I'll go after it and let Nick talk one second, but I'm going to tell you something what happened. I got catapulted. I got catapulted into flying to California every other week, meeting with uh, 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 Scott, uh, uh, Martin Bregman, with Al Pacino, Sylvester Stallone. Everybody wanted to play me, and I'm flying back. Oh, CAA <laughs> comes to me. And that was the beginning of my life after retiring from the police department. Thanks to this man. He's my family. He's my best friend. I love Nick Pledgey. And, Nick, let's talk about you. Well, I'd, <laughs> first thing i got to say, I feel the same way about you, Bo. Yeah. I mean, we just connected. We, we were both New York City born, raised guys. And yeah. So we had a lot a lot in common right to begin with. So it was yeah, great. And, and another thing, our, our lives also touched upon each other. When Margot had the lymphoma, Nora Ephraim, one of the yeah. greatest directors and writers, screenwriters, uh, was married to Nick. And she was going through a, a, a leukemia thing. And Margot was going through the lymphoma thing. We had the same doctor. Yeah. And I look in the, uh, in, the, in the waiting room and who's sitting over there, Nora and Nick. I walk over and Nora says to me, please, Bo, keep it a secret. And I did keep you it a secret, oh, yeah. complete secret, and uh, Margo made it, Nora didn't make it, it's and right. that was just, just what happened, but just our lives. But it and, bonds you together. Oh, without a that doubt. That kind of experience, that's a foxhole. 
Yeah. Right. You know, that's a foxhole. Yeah, but... Uh, Human foxhole. Let, let's talk about a little bit about you, and then our lives will touch upon each other as we're going along, because we're still involved. Anything I do, <laughs> yeah. Pelleggi's with me. Pelleggi don't make a move without me. I don't make a move without... And he was the one. We'll talk about Goodfellas and about Rayos, yeah. how Rayos, we casted people at Goodfellas. But let's start about your life, Nick. You grew up in Brooklyn. Whereabouts? Bensonhurst. Okay. Bensonhurst. I went to New York High School. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, 79th, 79th Street and uh, New Utrecht Avenue. So my father had a house there. Yeah. So I grew up in that world. I mean, that was... Uh, Which wise guys were around you and Ava then? Um, it was Joe Colombo. Uh-huh. Mostly Colombo guys. And, uh, I think Philly, Philly Diagardi was in my class at wow. New Utrecht. I mean, it was... They're, they're old news. These are guys you grew up with. They yeah, weren't... Well, yeah. You know, this was not anything special. And, and this was before... Uh, the Godfather, before the McClellan Committee, before but they Appalachia. But they were there, and they were operating. The, yeah. They were operating. And your mom and dad, both Italian, Nick? Oh, yeah. They, they were, I'm, I'm first generation. They were like, born like over me. there. Like Calabrese. Me. They're both Calabrese. Well, I'm German and Italian. You know, I'm <laughs> German. I don't know. We're going don't with know. the Italian. Yeah, <laughs> we're going with the Italian. <laughs> so where in Italy were they from? Calabria. Uh-huh. My, a small town in Calabria called Maeda. Uh-huh. And it's um, tiny. Know, Carlos yeah, we're speaks Italian. I'm Calabrese too. Oh, you I'm are. Where Villa are you from? San Giovanni. Yeah, they're both. Yeah. Okay. Is that in right Cosenzo or Catanzaro? Uh, by Reggio. Near oh, that's near. My grandfather's from Reggio. <laughs> See, it's it's a very it's a, it's a very intimate bunch. And once you're Calabrese, even when you got here, you would hang around together. Yeah, yeah. the Calabrese. Well, were, like like when, 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 by hanging out in Reggio's, I learned a lot about my. Italian heritage, yeah, yeah. where in, during the turn of the last century, when people would come with immigration, immigrant island, they would go up to East Harlem, yeah. different streets, 106th Street, 108th Street, and they would migrate to the Bronx, to Brooklyn, yeah. and well, not Staten Island at that point yet, uh, and Little Italy, and that was like the melting yeah. pot for all the Italians. Did you yeah. know that? East Harlem yeah. was like Huge. where they'd come, and then they would leave. Like, in other words, your, your gumbas from Calabrese land would come there, hey, gumbari, go Cousin Tony over that's there. That's right, on 114th Street. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And then you got settled in, and you began to get a job, and it began to make money. And then you kind of move out, and somebody else came in. But the, each of the Italian communities, Sicilians, Calabrese, wherever they were, they would have people from their hometowns clustered together in neighborhoods. It was a, yeah, it was it was a wonderful a, way to get I in. I tell you, I, I'm very... Very honored, and you know, if I call you Fredo, it ain't that bad. I, I, <laughs> called, I called Chris Como the other day. I says, come on, Chris, you should have smacked that guy. I said, all that tough talk, you should have grabbed my neck and said, I got you, Fredo. You, you know, Fredo was not that bad. He's like the dumber brother yeah. or the backstab. But, yeah, but people say stuff to you. I can't punch out everybody who calls me a name. No. Otherwise, I'll be getting locked up all every two <laughs> minutes. Right. So when you first started, you worked for a great place that I used to deliver pictures but Joe Costin was a photographer in yeah. the 1950s, late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. And uh, uh, Wally Langenbach, Walter Langenbach, he had a club foot. He was a photographer for the police department. Right. And I used to go delivering photographs. And one of the places I used to deliver is where I think he started, Associated Press, the AP. was in was in Rockefeller Center? 50 Rockefeller Plaza. How do I remember that? Yeah, because okay, you're UPS, a detective. And UPS, <laughs> uh, United you, Press yeah. International was on 42nd Street the in the Daily, Daily News. News building. 220. And then, and, then, <laughs> and then we used to have the World Telegram and Sun, and I used to take pictures. Joe Costin used to take pictures at the airport. At yeah. J- it wasn't John F. Kennedy, it was Idlewild. That's right. and, Idlewild. And what happened is Famous people like Sophia Lauren, so they would print them out, 8 by 10s and they would give me 12 envelopes. I would take the subway, rush around. I was only about 11 years old, and I used to deliver them to all these places in the Daily News, the Mirror, the Telegram and Sun and all that. We used to have about 10 newspapers That's in right, New York. Remember. And uh, so you started Associated Press. Yes. I started uh, my last two years in college. I went to Long Island University. And my last two years in college... I wanted a job, and uh, so one of the guys at the newspaper, I was on the school newspaper, school magazine, doing all that stuff, and he said, I'm looking for a job. He says, well, uh, the, the A.M.P. is hiring. I thought he meant the A.M.P. <laughs> yeah. the supermarket. You know? And so I said, where is it? 50 Rockefeller Plaza. I'm so stupid. I didn't realize. He thought no you were going to a supermarket. Well, yeah, what supermarket's <laughs> going to be in Rockefeller Plaza? <laughs> Retarded. I go there, and I say, A.M.P. is Associated Press, and he gave me the name Walter Kelleher. Go up and ask Walter. He'll give you a job. 
So I went up, told him Walter who I Keller. was. Huh? I remember that name, Walter Keller. Well, I heard he was one of the. He was uh, like a, the head of the mail room and the copy <sighs> boys at the Associated Press. He was. There's a Walter Keller who, who was a photographer. Maybe that's what I was. Thinking. Yeah, that's what you think. So you got a job there. So I got a job there as a copy boy, and uh, when I graduated from school, well, 1955. Uh, it, they said, the well, city editor said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'll probably take a master's. I was an English major. He yeah. says, you want to be a reporter? I said, yes. You knew how to spell. Yeah, I knew how to spell. And I, was, I had been, for two years as a copy boy, I watched those reporters operate and work. And so I began copying what they were doing, then compare what I would write to what they wrote. So I was really going to school there. And when they saw that's what I was doing, I did this for two years. Yeah. They, um, they said, what are you doing? So come here, show. And they began to teach me how to be a journalist, how to be a writer. We're talking 1953, 54, 55. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when I got out of school, he said, you want to be a writer? Yes, I wanted it by then. That's, that's what I wanted to be. And uh, he hired me. He said, okay, you start Monday. That was January 6, 1956. Wow. And then what kind of stories were you doing My initially? first story, Bo, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> My first story, I didn't know what the hell was going on. It was, when I look back, I realized what it was. He should have never given me that story. It was a Roosevelt Auditorium, and it was the night, the day, that Jimmy Hoffa was moving to take over the locals, wow. teams the locals wow. in New York. Wow, it reminds me of a movie that I, I, well, well, I walk. <laughs> <laughs> I walk in, I don't know what's going on. I ask one guy, he says, talk to him, he'll help you. I went over to this guy, and, but meanwhile, I'm walking around. And all of Jimmy Hoffa's guys, it was, he sent in a guy by the name of Johnny O'Rourke to become the head of the Joint Council of Teamsters and knocked off a guy by the name of Marty Lacey. Joe Glimko I, wasn't there, right? Uh, uh, Joe he, Glimko was he there? He would have been in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> but who was there was Tony Provenzano, Johnny Dio. What you about see, Frank? This, what about, was Frank yet in, in Frank it Frank Costello? No. No, Frank Shannon. Was he in? Oh, no, no, he isn't. No. No, no. Okay, go ahead. He was, you After know, the fact, go ahead. Buffalo. Uh, but that, they took it over, and um, that was a big move for Hoffa. So and, you would now, and you I were, was covering it. I didn't know what the, you didn't know what you didn't know what was going on. You didn't so, know how really big this thing. I had guy no was. idea. I didn't know who any of this was. So I go over and I talk. This to is this. before Carlo, before Hoffa went after oh, the yeah. president's brother. Yeah. you know, cursing him out and all that stuff. Nobody even knew who Hoffa was. Right. It was his move to take over the locals around and. The New York Joint Council was a huge local, and slowly have all the councils consolidating, under him, which his, is what uh, he was doing. Mm. It's a great move. So the guy who gives, I go over and he says, "That's all right, don't worry." So he takes a piece of like this, folded like this. He says, "When you when I give you the signal, read it in." So I take it and I go. He gives me the signal. I read it in the office. I mm. tell them everything I've got on this piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Next day I come into the office, and the city editor has got my story, and he's got the New York Times. Yeah, and he says, "Okay." You're on. You had everything the New York Times had. The guy who gave me that story was the New York Times writer, wow. the labor editor. Peter Keyes was his name. And he, uh, and he just gave it to me. I mean, it was such a generous thing to help this dopey kid. And you wrote a great article. And I, you know, I, I wrote it all using all the information he gave me. It made mm. sense. So that was your first That break was my first assignment, my first But my eventually, first eventually, you know, and the other assignments were normal stuff after that? Yeah, I mean, it, what happened was that it co my starting to work there, like Jimmy Hoffa taking over the Teamsters, all of a sudden people began paying more attention. Like a year later, in 1957, they had the Appalachia Raid uh, in November. We just did that movie. That's right. Mob Town with uh, Danny A. Yeah. Pretty that's good right. movie. That's Pretty right. damn good, 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 good movie. Good. I do play a, what's my name? Irving Bozeman Esquire. Irwin, Irving Bozeman Esquire. I was the lawyer for? Carmine Galanti. Uh -huh. Oh, your yeah, father's yeah, yeah, lawyer? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, Carmine's yeah. lawyer up there in Appalachia. It's a good movie. He's got a, uh, a $2 million movie, but it's very entertaining. Good. He put together it's a, a great... fascinating thing that happened. Yeah, the whole story about the sergeant who uh, was the one at Crosswell. The whole... Yeah, yeah, and it, 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 was, it was a great, it was great to film it, really good. Now, all right, so now you start associate Press. How did all of a sudden, I guess because of the Hoffman thing, whenever there was guys, well, take, their heads taken off, then crime became your beat. You got to remember, I started in 57, it was the, that was here. The, uh, in March of 1957, that's like a couple of months later, they shot Joe Frank Costello at the Majestic. What the hell is that about? So, so that you got begins, that case. So I got that. And, you know, and that, so you who, who shoots him? It's the chin. <laughs> the guy in the bathrobe. Is, I mean, it just, and slowly, 
The, and then, uh, and then in October, Albert Anastasia shot in the in the barber Your shop. Your timing was perfect, and Nick. It, exactly. And November, you had the Appalachia Ring. Holy moly! So that started the public interest in the mob organized in crime. organized crime, and it became a subject to cover. And I knew names. I knew what it was about just growing up in that world, and that allowed me uh, to really do and, uh, pretty eventually. Good stuff. Yeah. You become the authority on organized crime, and you knew every aspect of it from working the smallest stories that all the all the dots connect, and uh, and and eventually by doing this, you get recognized as the the go to guy on anything of organized crime. Yeah, there are other guys too who were very good at it. You're but... the best, Nicky. <laughs> Stop it. Come on. I don't want to be the only, but. Uh... But uh, what happened was that it became a big subject, right? And everybody got interested in it, and uh, um, it, it's a. Then the yeah. '60s hit. Yeah. Then they have the hearings uh, in Washington. That's right. With uh, McClellan, Kennedy, McClellan, with Kennedy, McClellan, Kennedy's yep. uh, brother there, right. and uh, and then during that time there was other other stories breaking. We had a lot of homicides, a lot of organized oh, yeah. crime homicides. Yeah, there were more horror, there were organized crime homicides because everything was breaking up, and it's the French Connection. You know the old the old timers that you might know who were in bookmaking and all that kind of stuff, loan shocker. That you know that. But they didn't want to give up any of that to the young guys. The young guys are coming. They're looking for money. They're looking for action. And they can make a quick hit with a heroin deal or lend somebody money for a drug deal. They started bringing heat right. onto the more, quote, legitimate wise guys. And that began a lot yeah, of guys because I mean, they were always under the radar. It was going on. They had the, they had the garment center. Yeah. They had prostitution, the gambling, or loan shark. Of course, the airports. <laughs> uh, and uh, I do have a little knowledge of that. And and over the years, they were under the radar. But yeah. then the flamboyant ones, they didn't want. Like the chin, you didn't even know he was alive. No, no. I mean, he's under the radar. Yeah. And you had a couple, because uh, I used to hang out in the 60s in a place called Jimmy Weston's. Oh, yeah, Jimmy and Weston's when, a great joint. We used to hang out one end, and the wise, guy, and, and the wise guys would be down the other end, the Westy guys and all that, yeah. and me and Joe Coffey would be on one end. <laughs> I tell you, you know what, it, 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 to, to have lived that time, was, it's just remarkable. It was an amazing period. And it was just funny, my whole life. When, whenever somebody asked me just the other day, Nikki, uh, why you didn't get involved? You know, you got all the, you play the mob guys all the time in this new movie, The Irishman, all that. Yeah. Why didn't you ever get involved with locking up organized crime figures? I said, well, it's very simple. I grew up with the biggest and the best. I knew them all from Ralph Scopo. So I said, just put me in a black neighborhood where the crime is high. I'll lock up the son of a bitches that are robbing people on the street, murdering people. Leave me alone. I said, how would it be just to go out with Fat Tony, all of a sudden after dessert, slap handcuffs on him? Yeah. Maybe, maybe Sonny Grasso could do that. I couldn't do something like that. Because I respected them, and, and the, get, the respect I had from uh, Ralph Scopo introduced me to Buckalo, Fat Tony, when I was a kid, 17 years old. I never forgot that. I always looked at it. But then once I became a cop, Ralph Scopo said, you can't come to the club anymore. I said, Ralph, you're like a father to me. He goes, you don't even understand what goes on there. Yeah. And I didn't, because my, my father was so tough. And you remember him when he died. Yeah. We were at the funeral, and he had big hands. And he used to beat the living shit out of me if I was not home at 9 o'clock. And the other boys were going to the airport. They were going shopping, and I couldn't <laughs> go. Otherwise, I would have been a great wise guy. I'd probably have been the best hit man. You would have been... Everything I did, I would have been the <laughs> yeah, best. You had the makings. <laughs> I had the makings. But I went the other way. And no one can understand why there's a respect factor from every yeah. one of them. Yeah. And you know who they are. And to this day, I mean, I have that respect yes. factor. Yes. And it, it's just funny because I really knew I had to keep an arm's length away. Yeah. So let's let's get to probably the most famous piece of work you ever did, I think, is you wrote the book Wise Guy. Now, initially, Wise Guy was going to be a book, and they talked about a low-budget movie that was maybe going to be filmed in Canada, Nick? Yeah, well, they, they, I did the, the book, and uh, it became a bestseller. Mm -hmm. So there was a little interest, and then it, when it hits the bestseller list, all of a sudden, the CAA and all the agents are interested, just like you. Yeah. And, you know, Brian De Palma was looking at other directors. And Erwin Winkler, who wound up the producer, was in Paris, and there's an English-speaking bookstore in Paris, the only place where you can read yeah. if you speak English. And he went in there, and he was reading New York Magazine excerpt of my book. 
Wow. In, and he reads this, and he says, holy smokes, Marty should read this. So he calls Marty Scorsese from, the, from Paris yeah. and says, Marty reads this. Marty reads it. Let's do it as a movie. Wow. That's how it happens. And, so then, and, then, and then Marty calls. And then Marty calls you, meets with but you. But I don't answer. I don't answer the phone. Why? Because <laughs> he calls. And I get to New York Magazine. And, you know, they'd have these people. You could, people call those little people. And it is a little thing. Martin Scorsese, then a number. And I knew that was bullshit. No, was Martin prank. Scorsese is not going. You I knew it. You know who it was? I knew who it was. It was David Denby, who was the movie critic at New York Magazine. Breaking looking to chunk. give it. Yeah. So I'm going to call this number. And then, ah, I got you. I got you. I, well, I don't care. <laughs> Oh, the next day I come in and not a note. And he said, that me, he's really busted my chops. The, so I, I go home that night and uh, I walk in the door and then she says, are you crazy? I said, what are you, this is Nora, says to me, are you crazy? What are you talking Why won't you talk to Marty Scorsese? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? I'm going to talk. No, he said that. That's not him. I said, it's J David Denby. And he said, this is bullshit. <laughs> I just got a call from Diane Dreyer. Now, Nora, who's a movie director, had a script supervisor, De Diane Dreyer. Well, Marty hired her for his movie, uh -huh. The Color of Money, that he was shooting in Chicago. And he goes to Diane Dreyer and says, you know Nora Ephron. That's his wife. Why don't you call her, find out why he won't call <laughs> me back? What's up with this Nick Pelleggi? He's not calling yes. me back. The most famous director in the world. He was on, he wasn't as high as he is today, but he was pretty damn high. Well, he had so already, I called he him ready, immediately. He already did Mean Street. Oh. He already did Street. Taxi Driver. Taxi Driver, Raging Bull. Oh, so he was pretty high. I mean, yeah, yeah. But he was, he was, he was something. And, uh, but I, I so called, you him, with him. called him right away. And we... We, even on the phone, we didn't have to go beyond the phone. We, but we was like, he's the same as I am. I mean, we felt a bond, you know. You yeah, just even know. though you didn't know him, you knew. Didn't, Michael, I didn't know him. Like, like, like right. the way you, your personality is. Yeah. They can meet you one time. You meet him once. Nick is Nick. He just. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it's yeah but and Marty was the same way. So he said, I can't do anything now because I got to finish the color of money he did with mm -hmm. Paul Newman. Then he had to do another movie, and he had no money to buy it. I said, you don't need money. I was okay. I said, you don't even, I want you to direct the movie. Nobody wow. but you. And so we had a handshake over the phone. Wow. We didn't even have, no, totally agents to go to hell. I don't need him. That, I'm that, doing it with Marty I'm Scorsese. I'm doing it with Marty Scorsese. And it was a bond, like from two street guys in a yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. Over the phone that we don't need these bullshit lawyers from Hollywood. And that bond has remained to this day. Oh, I know, I know. The, the, the new movie that uh, Nick was involved with, the rewrites and all that with the Irishman, and, uh, and Scorsese stays around, and he's still floating around. And your name <laughs> popped up again from Rick Yorn, again with this Rick new Yon. thing, yeah. with this trilogy thing that they want to do, Bo Dito, One Tough Cop, the yeah. trilogy from growing up with the wise guys. And again... Scorsese circling the uh, circling the air, saying he wants to do it. Yeah. But we know what happens in Hollywood. There's so many projects. You just the timing has to be yeah. very precise because there's a lot of great projects that just die on the vine. That's right. right. That's right. Things yeah. that they would want to do. I mean, there are things that Marty wanted to do. We we worked on a movie. Marty had always wanted to do a movie on Dean Martin. I remember mm. that. Remember, we worked on that thing for a couple of years, and we could never, never get... Never got me. It was going to be about Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., and the Frank Sinatra yeah. and all that. That whole Rat Pack and, period. And it never really... And this was, and then Marty had his neighborhood thing. Is that still going on? Yeah, I'm, we're working on that. I got to start... I'm working <laughs> well, on that Well, that's been going on for about 20 years. Come on, I, Nick. Wait, no, you know what happened? <laughs> But we were working on it, and I was saying, Marty, we had, it's getting long. We're like 400 pages. We're like a, you know, a six-hour movie. And he said, no, no, keep it in. Keep it in. We'll work at it. We'll get, take it out later. So the script gets getting fatter and fatter. This is over 20, 25 years. And now all of a sudden, what has happened, Bo, we're thinking about a movie. We'll cut it down to three hours. And <laughs> now Netflix comes along, which he did your movie on, The Irishman. That's Netflix. And Netflix says, what are you worried about a four-hour movie? No, we can we'll do it, it as a series. Yeah. We'll do so all of a sudden the neighborhood now looks like it might be the pilot wow. and the six episodes, and you can do a six-hour, quote, movie as a TV series. And well, that's why I think that's what Rick Yorn was talking that's about. That's what they're looking Marty. to do. I think, yeah. They have the access to Netflix, yeah. which need content. They all need that's content, right. and they got a great... Now, with, with this Irishman hit, forget about yeah. it. It's going to be yeah. hands down. But let's go back to... Cause let's most rewind of, a little bit about yeah. how did you initially meet Henry Hill? How did this whole come about? Well, that's, right wise yeah, guy? that's a great story. Yeah, the, what happened was, so now I'm covering all these wise guys. I'm writing stories about Bo. And, you know, we're in touch all the time. Uh, and I get a call from uh, uh, a lawyer by the name of Robert Simmels, who's representing Henry Hill. And uh, Henry Hill is now locked up. He's... 
What year we're talking about? We're talking, oh, Jesus. Um, that would be 83? The, yeah, something like that, 83, yeah. 84. And, they, and he calls in the, and the government, the FBI agents and the strike force, Ed McDonald at the Organized Crime Strike Force, yep. I had been covering stuff with them, and they knew me and they trusted me. Who Could you talk to Henry Hill and see if there's a book there? Because he needs money from a book contract to pay the lawyer. That's what it comes down to. So Was uh, he in witness protection yet? Oh, yeah. Oh. He, was, he was being... He, they were debriefing him. They got him buried in a Staten Island motel. Mm. They're not. He they was have, given up. Barrio. He was given everything. Well, we the talk most about. important is Jimmy Burke. Yeah, yeah, that was it. So that, so uh, I met with him, and uh, he had already met with Peter Moss. Like they had brought like Peter four Moss. or five other you know writers. Who Peter Moss was sure, another writer. What, the Valachi papers. He wrote the Valachi. And what Moss else? Papers. Uh, the Valachi paper and Peter Moss was involved with my dear departed friend, Lieutenant David Dirk. That's right. That's right. That's With right. Serpico. That's right. He did. Yeah. He did the Serpico. Yep. Yeah. Well, anyway, I come in. I meet Henry Hill at the U.S. Attorney's office, and uh, comes in and he's and he he's talking about. He says, uh, "Yeah." Then I had to go uh, and I met uh, uh, Wagon Wheels. I said, "You mean Fatico?" He says, "Yeah." I said, "Which one? Which brother?" Now, when he realized I know who Jimmy Fatico was, that, it, that his real name was Wag Wagon Wheels, that there's a federal statue based on him, he said, I want him. So he picked me you, as the yeah, right. Because you knew Because I knew the names. When he would mention names, I knew who he was talking about. He didn't have to explain what this guy did or what that guy did. Or, and it comes out of Bensonhurst. It comes out of hanging around with people uh, that I had a familiarity with it. And he felt that's good. I won't have to worry about it. So yeah. he picked me as the writer for the movie. So then he the picked you as the writer. I, it's just such a, it, the, the whole thing. With and good, we got on. I liked him. He's well, a, you know, when, when, once you start with Goodfellas, then all of a sudden Marty opens up. Marty then gets this guy, this acting guy. What's his name? De, De Niro. <laughs> Robert De Niro. And then all of a sudden they bring Joe Pesci. Now, I had met Joe Pesci when yeah. he was a waiter up with, uh, with what was Bronx? his name? The guy Al Denti. The, yeah, Joe Denti. Joe Denti. Denti. Joe Denti. Denti. So I met him when he was first up there. That's that far. I go back with Joe Denti. I was a cop when I met him. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they put these get this cast together of probably one of the greatest casts, which will be back for the Irishman That's coming right. in September, which we're all excited about. So now once the once the scripts are out there and once you're really getting in the meat of the scripts, then all of a sudden Henry tells you about obviously the Lufthansa Heights, yeah. about this crazy guy named Jimmy Burke who had the, the bar on Leffitt's Boulevard. I used to drink five or ten cent beers at his bar. <laughs> yes. And then all of a sudden, you're starting to put this all together. So he's typing it, Nick, the book Wise Guy. When you come and in. he's asking questions. And I'm like, oh, about the used car lot on Land Avenue with Paul Ivario. Oh, Henry Hill, that prick we threw out at a bar on, 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 on Queens Boulevard. He was a punk. He was never, I knew he was never, ever going to be a made no, guy. No. And then the next thing is Jimmy Burke. Jimmy Burke couldn't be gay, made either because he was Irish. But Jimmy Burke was one very notorious guy and, and he was scary. And everyone was afraid of him, including the Italians were afraid of him. So now, we end, you end up putting a screenplay together. Yeah. Now you got casting people there. You <laughs> use Ellen Lewis, probably Wonderful. one of the greatest casting directors, and I've been very fortunate to be involved with a few of our movies, and they put this cast together. But it really wasn't a cast that is as famous as it is now, but you put these all together, right. and then all of a sudden it was like making the best chicken soup, best chicken, yeah. best celery, best But carrots. what happened? You were a part of that. I mean, what happened was that they come on, he said, you know, this is like fresh material. This is a new kind of thing. I don't want the same faces people seen in movies before of being gangsters. He said, you know, I want to see. So he, I said, well, Bo, <laughs> well, why don't we talk to Bo and, we'll, and Frankie Pellegrino, and we'll... So Bo goes to Frankie and his friends, and he's Marty. Well, hold on. Now, wait. This is the table. The no. first table. So Nikki calls. He says, Marty wants to have dinner at Rayo's at my big table, right? <laughs> and uh, at the front. All of a sudden, Marty's there. Ellen Lewis, Ray Liotta, Lorraine yeah. Broccoli there. What's yeah. it? Brocco. Right, Lorraine uh, Brocco. You, me. And next thing is Marty Sidney. But he's not saying much. He's just looking around. At that time at the bar, it wasn't the way it is now. You had 
uh, Frankie Nose, his nose yeah. was two foot long. Yeah. My, uh, Mikey Black, he was dark complexion Sicilian. A uh, Petey Neck, his neck Petey was neck, stuck. Yep, in, yep. His neck was stuck. All these cheesecake, characters cheesecake. are out. Yeah, the, the Angela and the Jet sure. Cheesecake. Everybody's at the bar. He's all the boys. I used to drink with him when I was a cop. Marty is just sobbing this into his brain. So after we finished dinner, Marty goes, hey, Bo, can we come back next week? I said, Marty, whatever you want. He goes, you tell anybody who wants to be in this movie to show up next week. We're going to do casting right from here. Ellen Lewis was there. Next thing is we cast, we cast Frankie the owner as the wise guy in there. Frankie was great. And we casted all these guys with the bar scene in yeah. Goodfellas. And and then all of a sudden, the, the Scorsese said to me, well, you know, we need an arresting officer. I said, yeah. <laughs> Bo, you want to be the arresting? And he didn't have a script. And he just says, talk the way you would talk, Bo. Yeah. You're locking just the guy it. up. And that's exactly. And they left all those lines. Bye-bye, dickhead. Oh, yeah. you're a tough guy. Oh, we're having a fucking party. Oh, we're going to bake a cake. These are that's all all improvised. All improvised. Yeah. That's Marty. Yeah. And then I'm going to tell you something. When I first, uh, <laughs> when we had the premiere at the Ziegfeld. I think we Ziegfeld, had, right. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, when this movie hit, to me, it's the, one of the top three movies ever made. I'm, I put Godfather 1, Godfather 2, and Goodfellas. And now we got this other guy creeping up. This <laughs> Irishman could could have a little sp uh, sparkling with that. <laughs> and he, Nicky was involved with the writing also of the Irishman, too. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the really interesting thing about Goodfellas and Wise Guys, you know, like we talked about before, the the high profile cases in the fifties when you're talking about Frank Costello and yeah. Albert Einstein, they're bosses. So you know, they're they're very high level. They're almost like CEOs. Right. And Wise Guys about the street level, the, yes. the very you know the CD, the very stuff that it's not like The Godfather where they're in nice boardrooms. It's right. It's well, that's gritty. why I was interested in doing it when they came to me with Henry Hill. He was just a schleppy guy, he, but. The old man, Paul Vario, really loved him because Henry had grown up with Paul Vario's son, and they did an arson. And Paul Vario's son, they screwed it up. The goddamn gasoline got him, burned him up, and burned him so he was in the hospital for over a month, wow. streaking through the t tube, you know, all that yeah. stuff. And uh, Paul Vario went every day to see his son, but every day with the son was Henry Hill. His ah. best friend as a kid. Uh -huh. And he was there helping him with the straw. And Paul Vario saw that. So, that was with his so son when the his son he... died, I think a lot of Paul Vario's heart and memory went to this kid who was his son's best friend. And he took that kid as like his own kid, not like uh -huh. his son. But he, but he would always take care of his son's friend. And so, that gave Henry Hill an in on a level that he would never have right, been. Right, right, right. And like he, he was a low level guy. He yeah. was not really a He's high a go for it. He did go for it. But then he had all this knowledge about what Hen, uh, what uh, Burke did. Yeah. With the, the big catch it is the Lufthansa hire. They wanted That's that. That's the draw. That's the draw. It was It's based on a character who was a rat, but then he was around all the big guys and he had information on that. And uh, the rest is really history. Some of the greatest actors got their start. Who's that black guy? You see him everywhere now. Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah, that was his first, one his of first, his first movie. Part. Yeah, and he, he gets wackitated nicely there. That's very and, funny. And then, yeah. and then well, you bounce off Goodfellas, and then you write this other book called Casino. Yeah. And that, is, to me, was one of the most interesting because it has the involvement of the mob out of Chicago into Vegas. Where and the you, Teamsters, too. The, yeah, the with Teamsters, the Teamsters team. again, where you have Robert De Niro playing the Jewish guy and Precious the Italian guy. Yeah. And that, to me, was, was... That movie's right up my top five, too. But that was really exciting because it brings people into the world of the Italian mob yeah. guys that were financing the casinos and there were a lot of the sharp guys. And real fast, Lefty Rosenthal, what was Lefty that Lefty Rosenthal. That was, yeah. And I'll he tell was... you what he did to me. <laughs> Nicky introduced me to Lefty Rosenthal. He was supposed <laughs> to be the handicapper of the world. Oh, he was. He was said, the, the handicapper. He yeah. ran four casinos in well, Las Vegas. all I could say is Nicky <laughs> introduces me to him. And the next thing that happens, I said, you know, I was a degenerate gambler at that time. I'm not embarrassed to say I was a degenerate gambler. I used to bet college football, football, every, everything, professional. I say, hey, Lefty, give me like a, a dozen games for Sunday. Carlo, 
11 out of 11 friggin' losers. I told <laughs> Lefty, don't lose my friggin' number. I mean, you couldn't have picked 11 losers. And that, that's why I lost a little, uh, I lost a lot of money, but I lost a little taste for Lefty. And then the movie Casino comes out, and that was, that was excellent, excellent. The cinematography, every oh, aspect Marty, of it. Marty wanted to do that movie. Marty did three. It was like his trilogy. He, he discussed it. First, he had Mean Street. Street right. guys, tough guys. Bob De Niro plays crazy thick. Oh my God! You remember he throws the yeah. firecracker in the, in the in the the mailbox. And then then he wanted to do a regular street guys uh, on that level, um, the Henry Hill level, Paul Verri. Then he wanted to do the third one was at the very top. Right. So you got the lowest end of the mob, the middle end of the mob, and the top of the mob. And the top of the mob was their creation. Their creation of Las Vegas casinos. That was their creation. They did it. It would have never happened without them. It would have never happened without the money. Maybe later on something would have happened. But they actually are responsible for it. And it's a great achievement. Yeah. And suddenly these street guys are running these casinos. A billion dollar casinos. It's, a, it's just, and they were able to handle it. Guys legit like, money. Yes. Legit because yes, they're yes. making it legitimately. Yeah. And they and they didn't, and they really moved. And guys like from Shel Shel Cleveland, like Mo Dalitz. Started out as a very tough guy with a gun and winds up, grab boat leg in and winds up owning the Desert Inn. Builds the hospital who in did, Las who Vegas. Who played uh, uh, that comedian? I thought he was great. Don Rickles. Don Rickles. Don Rickles was Who was great. he playing Don again? I forgot. He, he was playing a, a Lefty Rosenthal had an assistant. Yeah. And he who's running the casinos for him. That's who he was playing. Wow. And he, but, he, but these guys, you know, a guy like Don Rickles and... They had been hanging around Vegas since it started. Nobody so they knew, knew. No, they knew the original guys. They knew Carl Cohen. They knew, you know, all of them. Who's the one that knocked uh, Sinatra's teeth out? That was Carl Cohen. Yeah. It, yeah. Was, at the, it was at the Sands, and Sinatra talked out bad, and he and, and he Cohen clocked him. What? That really happened. Yes. 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 Did they had to fly that? Sinatra out that. to get a new They new had to teeth. fly him to, I think, Palm Springs, right? Yeah. Wherever yeah. his doctor was, his yeah. dentist. Yeah. He actually punched, knocked his teeth out. Yeah, I mean, back then, and he was running at that time with our mutual friend. He was running with the real guy, Louis Dome, yeah. and all those guys. I mean, Cohn could have got wackitated if, if it wasn't But bar, he had right? too much heat with, I mean, they knew that Sinatra was a pain in the ass. Yeah. He got loaded and drunk, and he felt that his reputation was out. He would be mouthing off. in the face. Yeah. Not but you couldn't do out. that with Carl Cohn. Carl Cohn was that big. Had been around since Prohibition. Wow. So he wasn't a big guy, Carl. No, he, he might have had a punch up. Wow, I thought, but it, was, he I thought would, it was a big Jewish guy no, like six. No, no, he was short guy. And, but oh, a bull, my friend Frank Sinatra. You know, I know, I knew Frank Sinatra. Oh, now I'm. I thought it was a big Jewish guy about no. six foot five or some shit. Oh like, no, no, it was no, a little little twerp? little guy in his like near seventy. Wow, <laughs> sixty to seventy. But he had a good right hook. He had a great hook, <laughs> and he it was not the first time he threw a punch. Yeah, so what but I, Carl Cohen would not be there unless he was a very well, if very. If Louis tough Dome guy. was there, he would have broken up. I'm sure. Yeah, well, no, he wouldn't have done it with Louis Dome. Yeah. See, if Dome was there, Sinatra would have quieted Jilly down. Now we're not talking about Jilly. No, Louis Dome was the guy. Yeah, because right. everybody talks about my friend Jilly. Oh, it's Louis Dome was the main main guy. Yeah. My very dear right. friend. I was with him till he died. Yeah. And uh, so now we do we do Casino. And that turns out to be one of the great movies also. And then you get involved with another one. Another one, with, I had done a movie with uh, uh, Danzel Washington called The Bone Collector with Marty Bregman. Yeah. I was one of the producers on it. But then you, you, you bring him into another one, a very famous thing about a guy from Harlem. Yeah. I didn't go after him. I used to go after Nicky Bonds. Yeah. But the other but guy. But the real one was the, Frank Lucas. Frank Lucas was before Nicky Bonds. Oh, yeah. And with the uh, Vietnam coffins with the heroin in there. And, yeah. Tell us that but story. I, with but that. I, I, I'm, when you live in the world I was living in there, it was great fun and, you know, just hanging around. I love, hang around. By the way, Danzel Washington, the Classiest actor, hands down, yeah. most generous, most beautiful man in yeah. the world. Terrific I miss him. guy. Terrific yeah, guy. wonderful. So, um, uh, I'm, you know, just uh, walking around and the one of the agents says, you know, there's this guy locked up. He's doing 15 years for narcotics. Frank Lucas, he's got a great story. You ought to go talk to him. So I get the permission from the Bureau of Prisons and I start going in and talking to Frank Lucas. And he's willing to talk. He, because we had new, but you know, like I knew the stuff I was writing. He knew. And we got on very well. I liked him a lot. And he started writing out on people and they let him out after 15 years. And I thought this was a great story. I mean, this guy was a street guy who figured out because he, he was selling dope. Uh, and 
a lot of the guys you'd sell the dope to, they say, this is shit. This stuff is no good. He says, yeah, the good stuff's in NAM. That's where you get good stuff. So he says, Before, the good a lot stuff, of people, six times. Right. GIs that came back, came yes, back addicted. And it was all the GIs coming back from Vietnam. Yeah, they didn't get the good hooked. shit. <laughs> when they got back here, they were getting crap and Baby great stuff. Yeah. So Frank gets it in his mind. I've got to get on a plane and go to Vietnam. <laughs> I'm going to buy the good stuff, and I'll have it shipped here, and I'll have the best stuff. In which the is, coffins of the GIs. Which is what he does. <laughs> it's sacrilegious to open the coffin up. So what better place to put the dope in is in the so, coffin? Yeah. And they went, and he, he bribed all the sergeants and all the guys at the mortuary so that he could put his dope in certain things. And it would come here, and it would be picked up at the airports, at the military airports by military Escort. police guys he had. And he would bring that dope in. He had factories where girls with masks were chopping this stuff up. It wow. was it was an enormous and business. R Russell Crowe was in there. Right? Russell Crowe, and he got caught ball. by a, a New Jersey uh, 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 detective, um, assistant prosecutor, actually, um, uh, uh, and it Richie Roberts. It wasn't the New York guys. No, it was Richie Roberts and... and yeah, uh, of course, probably Sonny Grosso was investigating, taking the drugs. Well, what happened was order he came money, here. Order money. <laughs> That's right. My friend Sonny. Oh. We still want to know what happened with that French Connection money. You know, Carl, I'm doing an investigation on that. Oh, he has stuck. a big house on the water. Oh, <laughs> only <laughs> kidding, great. Sonny. We, we should get Sonny Grosso on. He's yes. a great storyteller. But anyway, the Lucas gives this unbelievable story. So I write that as a New movie, every movie idea, and then I wind up on another movie, and nobody bought it. But Lucas is out, and I ran across Brian Grazier. Brian, Brian Grazier, Grazier producer. Yeah, I and I tell him the story. He says, Oh, I'd love to meet him. I said, Let me see. So I get a hold of Frank Lucas, and I said, I think we got a deal. So I put Frank Lucas on a plane, and he and I fly to Universal Studios, yeah. where we walk into Brian Grazier's office. Brian died to meet the real Frank Lucas. Yeah. I mean, this is not some actor bullshit actor coming in pretending. Yeah. This is goddamn Frank Lucas. Drop you off the roof. I mean, just... That was it. And, and, and he said, let's figure, do it. I better do this movie, otherwise <laughs> I can have a bit right. of an enemy. Well, I, I was stuck. I think I'm doing something with Marty at the time, so I can't write it, but I can produce and explain it so they get Steve Zalian, who did The Irishman. Uh-huh. And Steve Zalian won an Oscar for the... Uh, for Schindler's List, he's a great, great, great screenwriter. So they say, how about Steve Zalian? So they bring him in to write the script, and I spend four months at the Regency Hotel with Steve Zalian and sometimes Frank Lucas explaining to Steve Zalian that world, because that mm. wasn't his world. Wow. And, and then Steve wrote the script. I was the executive producer. And I think I think American Geist is a terrific movie. He did a great what job. What I tell you, what a great mind we have here. One of the greatest. What stuff are you working on now, Nick? Well, I'm working on something that might be of interest. It may have Denzel Washington in it. Oh. So, and it has to do with. Let's I was bring him up to Carl. rails. <laughs> right. Let's bring him up to rails for you can do it. He loves rails. I you know. invite him and tell him all my guess. But anyway, what he what we're trying to do now is do a movie. Uh, the, Antoine Fuqua is the director, uh, and it's been in the papers. At the beginning to mention it, it's about a, a, a Wall Street guy who pretends he's dead with a hedge fund, pretends he's dead and moves the hedge fund money to China where he wants to create a new life. You have an office in China. Yeah. You know people in China. Yeah, I yeah. have to talk to somebody. Oh, in China. don't worry you about got, that. I got, okay. It's fuck, it's, excuse my language, it's zombie land. Yeah. There, nobody smiles. Everybody's got a puss on their face. Oh, I like and it. like we were just talking to John Batchelor here before. Yeah. That's, that's a hot spot, that Hong Kong. It is. Because huge. now the, the president of China, maybe when this thing airs next week, there'll be a war by now. But the point is, that's a real hot spot. Yep. Because the British owned it 22 years, the deal was made. Yeah. And all of a sudden now they're trying to flip on the deal. And he knows he has to be tough because it's a communist he, country. And he'll lose Taiwan. Yeah. See, yeah. Hong Kong's little, but if he put, if Hong Kong Taiwan's is able to go away, next. then Hong and Kong those make -believe will be. And, uh, and those make believe islands hmm. they built the over there. artificial islands in the South yeah. China Sea. Yeah. But I, I tell you, you know what? The, the, it's so exciting to watch, to start something in an infancy. How was your feeling? Because I keep going back to Goodfellas because yeah, yeah. my, my life started with, kind of with Goodfellas in the acting business. But how does it feel to see your movie when you're at the Ziegfeld? The, one of the biggest movies ever made. What kind of feeling is that, that you were the chef that made that dinner? You know, I, I, it just I, it doesn't mean much. I, just, I have more fun hanging out with the guys, getting the story, than going to that. Because I remember at the open, a lot of times with Nora, 
She's just looking at me. Now, this is a woman who had been nominated for three Academy Awards. So she's not somebody who's uh, yeah. home cooking dishes, cooking, cooking pasta. Uh, and I remember going to these things with this. She, you know, she hit me in the arm. She said, Nick, Nick. I said, what? You're supposed to be having more fun. <laughs> I didn't get a kick out of the public thing. I, well, I you know I didn't. I try to avoid well, the little, red, the little, red little, carpet. I don't want to embarrass him, but the greatest love story was Nick and Nora, and yeah. that's that's truly yeah. Well, and they were they were we got people on. that got married, and they they were so in love. Two different personalities. She was really the the the. the a, a positive personality. Nick was more of a conservative, low key, but they fell in love, and it was one of the great love stories of all times. Because I was with him till the end, and it was his, his greatest love of yeah, your life. Yeah, she was, no question. Yeah, but yeah. you know, she was something else. Yeah, she, she was, was tough. Yeah, she was tough. Yeah. and I got mad at her one time. <laughs> I got mad at her one time. <laughs> And we, she was filming this movie about this bookstore with Meg Ryan. You got mail, sure. You yeah. got mail. I had a great part. I was a garbage man, a private sanitation. And I'm there, and I'm going after Meg Ryan. And I was there, and it was cool. All of a sudden, the phone rings. Bo. I say, yes, Nora. She goes, hi, Bo. How you doing? I said, Nick. I says, Nora, what's wrong? She goes, I got some bad news. I said, Nora, what? Uh, we had to cut the movie down. Oh. And your scene is cut out. I said, oh, I was so depressed. I says, Nora, I love you. I don't care. I love you. Pick me for another movie, please. Yes, she would. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, Nick, your life really, and honestly, when I said it to Carlo, I mean that with all my heart. Without Nick Pelleggi, there wouldn't be Bo Deedle as you know him. No, today. without Bo Deedle, there wouldn't be oh, Bo Deedle. You had to have the personality and the character. You know, I, I covered cops since I started, 1956, a lot of them are fabulous, good guys. You know them. They're yeah. terrific. They don't know how to tell a story. They don't have a visual image. Right. You go and you talk to them about stuff they've done, good stuff, yeah. and you they get one word it. answer out of them. You know, yeah. both, nope. yeah. I'll never forget the two FBI guys, the boss of bosses. Uh, yeah. uh, the two uh, FBI agents, I brought them on Imus, Imus in the morning. Uh, O'Brien and the other guy, they were ones that locked up. Gambino, they, they were terrific but, agents. My God, yeah, they got the great clock. agents. But oh. I bring them on a radio show with their book with Imus, and the guy's going. Uh, he was asked the question by Imus. He's going, "Nope, yep." <laughs> you thought he was in nope. the grand jury, <laughs> and then all of a sudden we finished. Imus says, "Don't bring those fucking guys <laughs> back here again." <laughs> but that's exactly but what he said. That, they broke one of the biggest cases against Gotti and yeah, all that they stuff. They put the plant and, the bug in yeah, Castellano's and they, house. And, and sat down, but they can't explain the story. Yeah, yeah. So what good is having great stories if you... I guess part of a storyteller is kind of like a director, in a sense, or a screenwriter, where you bring that, that value to, for entertainment. If you don't have entertainment, you can wipe your ass. Yeah, nobody's going to listen. You that's know, Then you, that story doesn't get told. So that was what I ran into you. And you started to tell the story because I was talking about how the street cop really works, what yeah. really goes on in the street. And that was Bo at that time. And then you had the nun case yeah, where you broke that. And the mask. Uh, right. And I, how you broke the nun case, which like a street is, cop that is breaks the, it. That, is that the was first, the key. That was, the, I mean, that was 90 pages of the book, One Tough Cop, which he, uh, Nick was the one that gave us the, uh, the uh, introduction. But the point was that case to this day, yeah. I can't explain the feelings that I got. And Tommy, God rest his soul, Tommy Collins yeah. had, had, di had died. But I can't explain that sixth sense. Like all of a sudden, I get a feeling about something, and I can't explain. It's non-tangible. You know, like a, I pull a car over. Two guys got guns underneath their front seat. Yeah, I committed a fucking legal search, but they had the guns there, yeah. and I just had a feeling. But today, if you do you it, do they'll that. be locking you up for yeah. illegal search. Yeah. You so could. my point is that you know I'm very honest about it. Statue of limitations. Thank the good Lord. I didn't, I don't know if I killed. Anybody. I don't think I killed anybody. But no. you know, in reality, I I talk about hanging the guy off the building by his ankles. The guy shot a cop, and I questioned him. I lost grip. But I was able to hold him by one. Today, if you hear that crap, putting guys' heads in toilet bowls after the nun got raped, that the shit was up to my arm here. I put his head into the toilet bowl, and we got more information, yeah, more yeah. information. And when Vinnie Rayo says, oh, guy said they come on 25th Street. So I looked at the spot, yeah. and I saw there was a ladder coming down. The convent was three stories. So I said to myself, two people, sex predators, they're not yeah. sex predators' partners. 
Burglary had to be the was the motive. So go after the burglars. Then I put another guy out a window, and he told me about a short guy. A short guy with a limp Remember turned that? out to be a bop. I, I mean, it, it, the story of the nun rape yeah. investigation catching one in Chicago. You got a guy getting off a bus at 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> now I get the permission to fly out at 7 o'clock in Chicago. What do you do in New York City with the guy that you think had uh, committed this most, heine most heinous crime in New York history, labeled yeah. by Mayor Koch? What do you do? So I look at the area code for uh, for Chicago, and I said, could I have the detective division? Oh, we don't have that. <laughs> oh, we have the violent crime section. I said, that sounds good. <laughs> Sergeant Kelly, I'll never forget the voice. And I talked to him after it years ago. Sergeant Kelly, violence crime. I said, Sarge, how long are you on the force? He said, I've been on 20 years. I said, do you ever get a feeling? Yeah, this has to do with the case with this nun that got raped with 27 girls. You know all about it. It was a national story. I said, I really ain't got nothing, but I got a feeling. I said, do me a favor. Put a surveillance. He's got his girlfriend with him. He's this. I gave a description. So now I gave him his name. He goes by the name of Chicago, his nickname. So this guy used his detective ability. Now... I, uh, Tommy went to the McDonald's to get McDonald's breakfast for everybody. We were going to fly out at 7. Now at 6 o'clock, the bus got in ahead of time. Next thing is, Bo, so the homicide detectives are all there. You got bullshit. You, 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 you don't have nothing. Next thing is, the phone rings. Bo, Sergeant Kelly, get on. Sergeant Kelly, uh, uh, Bo Deedle, Bo, we got you, boy. He fessed up. <laughs> Third floor when they raped the nun on the third floor. I said, what? So he had the, the bottom line is they took him to the Great Lakes. They put a shotgun in his mouth, <laughs> and they got him to the door. I mean, when the nun was getting raped, they were carving the crosses, and she didn't have too many rights. Fuck him. That's right. And I'll tell you, that's how. Then we get the second guy, Max Lindemann. When you ever hear a guy named Max Lindemann, a black guy, Tommy locked him up during the 77 blackout. So we go hit that building where he lives. He, he ain't there. Next thing was the wrong apartment. He moved out. We get the next address. So I go to the next. I said, Tom, you bang on the door. And I, I go up the fire escape. The windows open up slowly. You see him, yeah. And all of a sudden, he's going to sneak out. I had the old brass knuckles. Douche, I gave him a shot. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Down up there. So now I got him in the interrogating room. We have him for three hours there, all the sharp detectives. Eh, you guys beat him up. He didn't, he didn't know nothing. He already was identified, but the other one said he did the rape. I was only there, but he puts himself. Right. Next thing is he says something about my mother. You remember my mom. He said, why don't you go after your mother? I said, why would you talk against my mommy like that? Yeah. Allegedly, yes, I did. Statute's over. I gave him a right freaking hook. I broke his jaw. Yes, I did. And after that, they pulled me out of the room, and then the detectives talked to him, and he fessed up to the whole thing and all that. Did I That's crack six. him in the jaw, Nikki? Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. And I think he's the mayor of Baltimore or something now. He's been out of jail <laughs> for the last 20 <laughs> years. Mayor, but, you know, you had to do what you had to do. But it was... It was, it was Dog eat dog. It was a oh, very tough period. When, I, when, when you remember when I decoyed, I was hospitalized yeah. 30 times. I got stabbed thinking when my lieutenant general yeah. shoot him, Bo. Right. I never shot nobody. I headlocked him. You never Headlocked him and yeah. fight no, with him all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But I tell you, it was a different era. But, I mean, that's what a story about a movie. One Tough Cop, the movies, was a $7 million cheap movie. That story can be told in reality yes. again. I think it's the, ready today. And I think it's ready, but the only pro problem you're going to have is a lot of black ba backlash with this political correct bullshit. But if you're going to make a realistic movie about a time period, that's the time well, you period. Could, you could make it, I think you could satisfy both worlds. Yeah. I mean, nobody's, you know, nobody doesn't want that mugger who mugs their mother on 111th Street to go free. Right. Or, I don't care who that is. Or someone that rapes and uh, none in the common, not, no, that, carves 27 crosses and puts a broom into a vagina, pisses on her and leaves her for dead. Do you really care about that guy who broke his jaw? No. I don't no. think anybody would. Yeah. And, you know, and people from... People living in his same building don't like him <laughs> once they hear what he did. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a middle area that you could... Um, yeah. Do for this movie. Well, Nick, are you on this social media stuff? No. Well, okay. <laughs> I'm on the lamb. I'm we do kid. something every uh, podcast. Well, 56 is all we have. 59. 59. I There's thought no we were like 59. in the 60s, Carl. Okay, 59. Yeah. We always ask our guest, yeah. who's the punk of the week? Now, punk of the week means a situation or a person, something that really pisses you off. What is aggravating to you? Is your pasta too overdone? What, is, what pisses you off? <laughs> you know? 
That's a big problem for me because it doesn't. I can't think of anything that right now. Come is on, Nick, something's got to. What the hell you. is pissing me off? Well, I think, yeah, the thing that's pissing me off is like the computer stuff and the telephone uh, that they sent me in. Like I, I got podcasts on my telephone, yeah. and I press a podcast, and an Uber shows up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it is. And then my whole, and then if I have to send my son a message, and then I press it, it takes me forever to type the damn words because my fingers are too thick, and I'm not, I'm not used to that. Yeah. So if that is anything that's pissing well, you off, I, I, I it's kinda, that part of it. I didn't think of what bothers never people. me, but you know what bothers me? This bothers me. The attention that people put on these I, stupid that's right. iPhone that's devices. Right. So much time is wasted on yeah. bullshit. Right. Social media, Instagram. People at dinner they take a picture of their freaking food. I said, what the fuck? What are you going to yeah. do with the yeah. picture of your food? Wait, hey, well, what happened last night? My cousin Gay, Talise, yeah. he's my cousin. We, we're going to have dinner. So we go up. You know Gay, Talise, sure. right? Yeah. That's his so we go, up, we go up to Marion Scotto. To, yeah. To Scotto. Fresco. Yeah. So I call Marion. She was there. So it gave me a chance yeah. to say hello to her. And Gay and I is sitting there and there's four people across from us all having dinner together at Scott's, which is a beautiful, fabulous restaurant. And they're all talking on their little phones. They're all going on their phones. Four people. Now, what the hell? Where do you go? You can stay home and work on your phone. I hate the iPhone. I hate social media. It's the ruination. See? And it was something in there. We're, we're, we're together again on another. No, no, <laughs> I, I totally concur yeah. with you. I really, I'll be honest with you, and I'll say it on the air. When you th think you're talking to Bo on social media, you know who you're talking to? Carlo. <laughs> I can't I can't deal with it. But Carlo is in my head. He knows yeah. how I talk. He just wrote a magnificent, I give him bits and pieces yeah, yeah. of his story, and he puts it together about the Epstein thing. Carl is a tremendous writer, right. but he thinks the way I think. He's he's like a sponge that sponged yeah. out my brain power, and he puts it on paper, and, it, it, and I let, let people know. When you send me emails and all that, Call is the one yeah. who's the answer, but call is the answer for me. And if it's something important, I tell Carlo. If it's business related or someone I really can help, let me know. Other than that, I don't want to know some chick 35 years ago who I banged all of a sudden wants to get banged again. I'm not interested. Oh. And you can have her, okay, Carlo? Uh, 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 what's pissing you off, son? You know, my phone, too. You know what? It's too much. I think this weekend I'm just going to shut it off and just hang out. Do you, do you know I don't take, a, take a little digital did you, vacation. Did you know, Carlo? I do not look at the social media anymore. And when I first came out with the Twitter, right? We we go on Twitter. Well, Carlo goes on yeah. Twitter. When I first, I'm answering people, people MFing me back and forth. I said, why would I want to waste my time? Yeah. This is a loser. I don't want any of my brain power. I'd rather watch Casino and Goodfella right. back to right. back on a Sunday afternoon than look at this stupid ass phone. Yeah. So yeah. I, can, I agree with you. And your thing that bothers you? Yeah, my the phone. It's too much. Text but, messages, social media, whatever. I'm gonna this week. I'm just gonna. Decompress. Just chill, right? Just chill. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so we off. all agree on something. But yeah. Nikki and Carlo, why don't you wrap things up, buddy? All right. So thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, we appreciate our fans. You can find the show wherever you get podcasts and also OG Podcasts on Twitter and Instagram. You can email all your questions to one tough podcast at gmail.com. We love when our fans write in. We have to do a special shout out to Peggy from Nashville, Tennessee, who listens every week and she loves the show. And, uh, Peggy, keep listening. Uh, subscribe to our show. we got some great guests coming up. Uh, thank you very much to Nick Pledge for you. being here. And you could tune in next week, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Bo. Always.